everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to day five of the Eat the Rainbow Challenge. So today we're going to be exploring gut and immune health and our foods and colors of the day are brown and white. And yes, I'm still Ocean Robbins, CEO and co-founder of Food Revolution Network. So excited to be here with all of you. We're joined again today by, by Nicole D'Andrea Russert, FRN's lead dietitian and recipe developer. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Ocean. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you may be. <laughs> yes, and absolutely. And also Rosie McKay, our culinary and nutrition associate. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Ocean. Hi, everyone. Happy day five. Yay. And also Will Benitez, our community success manager and nutritionist. Hi, Will. Hi, Ocean and everyone. Happy brown and white day. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Happy brown and white day. Uh, honorary rainbow colors, as we say, because they are part of the culinary rainbow. So we're thrilled also that everybody else is here today. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our special guest of the day. But first, I want to award prizes from yesterday's entries. As you know, every day of this challenge, part of the challenge is to make one of the two recipes of the day and post pictures in the forum of the recipes that you have made and or narratives explaining what it was like, what you thought of it, what you did, how it tasted, most importantly. And uh, two, um, excuse me, one picture is worth two random entries in our drawing and one narrative alone is worth one. You have to post by the end of the day in order for it to count. So yesterday's winners are number one, Nora Sandoval, who said, good morning. I just finished the creamy corn chowder recipe. Since I did not have sweet potatoes, I added a half cup of chopped carrots to add the orange color. Once the veggies were tender, I mashed them to add a more creamy consistency. Yum. Thank you for the beautiful recipes. They've been fabulous. Well, Nora, thank you. And I'd like to award you with a lifetime membership in Whole Life Club. Congratulations. You're not going to have access to FRN's signature, signature membership community. You'll get new recipes and action step videos every single week. You can submit your questions for a new action hour with a guest expert every month. You'll have access to our moderated forum with coaches and dietitians and nutritionists and our entire library with hundreds of mouthwatering recipes and expert interviews and lots and lots more. So congratulations, our team will follow up with you. Now our second prize of the day goes to Evelyn Minari, who said, just got my orange challenge done and my biscuits are delicious cookies. I used what I had on hand, so I made a number of substitutions, oat flour, lemon, shredded carrots, and added some organic flaked coconut so it tastes like carrot cake cookies. So glad to know how to make plant-based buttermilk. I will always use lemon for mine. Have a lovely weekend. Well, Evelyn, thank you so much for making this recipe work for you and being creative and adventurous. We want to reward you with an advanced empowerment package from the 2023 Food Revolution Summit docu-series that we completed last month. So you will now have, now have all the episodes and the complete expert interviews from the summit plus transcripts and bonuses and lots more. Congratulations, our team will follow up with you. Well, everybody, now it's time to move into more of today's program. This is our last guest expert interview day in day five out of six in the Eat the Rainbow Challenge. And today we have a really special guest today. After I interview him, we will move into more conversation about the colors of the day and the recipes of the day with Nicole and Rosie and Will. But now I get to introduce my dear friend, one of the great leaders and legends of our plant-based food revolution movement, Dr. Joel Furman. Joel Furman, MD, is a board certified family physician and internationally recognized expert on nutrition and natural healing. Through his wildly popular series of PBS specials, his seven New York Times bestsellers, and the creation of the Andy score to quantify the nutritional quality of food. Dr. Furman has brought the message of nutritional healing and his nutritarian approach to millions of people. He is the president of the Nutritional Research Foundation. He serves on the faculty of Northern Arizona University's Health Sciences Division, and he operates the Eat to Live Retreat in San Diego, 
where people come from all around the world to lose weight and recover their health. He was also kind enough to write the foreword to my most recent book, 31 Day Food Revolution. Joel, welcome. Great to be here. Always a right. pleasure. Well, I just love your work and I'm so honored to have your voice here in this Eat the Rainbow Challenge with us. Um, we're focusing a bit today on gut health and the microbiome. So I'd love to start with that and ask you to define for us, what is the microbiome? Well, we have billions of bacteria that line the digestive tract, particularly a heavy coating on the, that covers the villi and the small intestines, these finger-like projections, because our gut is, is the inside of our gut is a tube, but it has these hairs, and all the digestion goes through these little fingers in our gut. And we have a coating of gram-positive bacteria, and as we get more diversity of healthy bacteria in the gut, it crowds out and prevents unhealthy bacteria and yeast forms from getting a footing. And also as the microbiome thickens and you have a healthy biofilm that coats the gut like a plastic coating, then it acts as a filter to filter out bacteria to actually slow the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream from carbohydrate digestion to make your glycemic load of your blood lower so you don't need much insulin and to level out the sugar spikes between, you know, between meals. So there's a lot of, there's also communication between the gut and the brain and the tightness of your gut and the integrity of your gut and the immune system and the intraepithelial lymphocytes, the defenders at the gates of the castle that guard the, the body from taking in viruses and bacteria and poisons build up based on the healthy food you eat and the health of your microbiome affects the health of your immune system in the gut. And the, the tightness and the integrity of that gut is related to the tightness and integrity of the blood brain barrier in the brain as well, preventing toxins and other substances from penetrating the brain. So yes, it's very, it's complicated, but at the same time, it's simple. You eat the right foods, you build the right gut, you build the right immune system, you build the right brain. Okay, so what are a super high level, and I know you go deep into this with books and books on it, but what mm. are the right foods that optimize gut health at a like broad level? On a broad level, I like what you're doing. And the reason I like what you're doing, because the best gut health occurs when people have a wide variety of different foods in their diet, different types of fibers, different types of polyphenols, different types of beta of glucans. In other words, you know, you could say it's not one food, even though we say mushrooms probably have the most power to reduce the growth of unhealthy bacteria in the gut and to actually bind toxic metals and to keep toxins from entering the body. And we say magical mushrooms. And so mushrooms are a, a key food and they're white and they're brown and they're an incredible food. They've been used medicinally for thousands of years in the human diet for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's an amazing food for you, protective food for humans. There's even a, a compound called ergothionine in mushrooms that represents a, a receptor on our cells to stabilize aging of the DNA. And, and this is a, a, a nutrient found predominantly in mushrooms. It's amazing how the human body is dependent on mushrooms. But in any case, we're also onions and other white and brown food that are our richest source of these organosulfide compounds. And we have many people who know that when they cut an onion, it makes them wanna cry from the sulfenic acid it releases. But as you're cutting the onion or chewing the onion and you really, a, a chemical reaction is occurring that's forming these organosulfide compounds that forms the fuel for the immune system's ability to seek out and destroy abnormal cells. And so onions become an integral part of immune development. And then, so we're talking here about cooked foods and raw foods, but we're talking about cooked mushrooms and cooked beans. I think beans are a brown food and grains like oatmeal are, are white or brown food too. And these foods, grains and beans are also um, super important. You know, by the way, oatmeal has um, is like the richest source of the diet of these soluble fibers. There's a lot of insoluble fiber all over the place, but oatmeal is such a great source of soluble fibers. And then you have the, the beans, which are the highest source of resistant starch, 
the highest source of obviously inositol, penticus, phosphate, and slowly digestible starches. And they form a great prebiotic to build healthy bacteria. So mushrooms are like the ultimate prebiotic Onions are a prebiotic, and of course, beans and even some parts of gra and some grains are prebiotic foods that fuel the, fuel the growth of healthy bacteria. And I think one of the themes of this week is you're having people eat the rainbow, which means eat a wide variety of food. And we used to think like taking probiotics or taking lactobacilli or acidophilus builds the healthiest gut. And now we know that's not true. What builds the healthiest gut is the widest variety of colors, the widest variety of foods. And we have this unprecedented opportunity in human history to eat a diet and to eat even eat a meal with variety that, in, that improves our health. I'm saying variety of foods improves our health. And this is a new phenomenon in nutritional science. And we have a, this, and we have a new opportunity to eat more variety of plant foods than we had in, so, uh, you know, macrobiotic diets or fruit diets or diets based on one food, like eat all soy or eat all potato. We know that it's better to have a wide variety of foods for it really to push that envelope of human longevity. Yes, fabulous. Every single food brings a different nutrient profile and they yes. work together and reach the body in different ways. And it's the diversity of that, that, that that's so powerful. Um, Thank you. And thank you for highlighting some of our colors of the day with a special focus on mushrooms and alliums and, uh, you know, and even oatmeal and, and beans, honorary brown and whites. I suppose they can fit in there too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm curious, you talked about soluble fiber and you talked about prebiotics, right. prebiotics being that which feeds the good bacteria in our guts. So um, in general, is soluble fiber a prebiotic? Are all prebiotics soluble fibers? Is there a distinction there? No, no. Um, no, the, um, there's a host of different um, types of prebiotics that people can, then that just means the bacteria live on that. Like resistant starch is a great prebiotic for the growth of healthy bacteria. And resistant starch is found in all carbohydrate foods. It's just highest in like, it's high in corn and beans and peas, and, and, and but it becomes a great, um, it's not like easily absorbed and digested because it's resistant to enzyme breakdown. So it's fermented by bacteria into short chain fatty acids. And the fer fermentation of undigestible fibers and resistant starch um, grow, then become a fuel for the growth of healthy bacteria. And the, then the bacteria themselves turn the starch into fat. And the fat that's thus produced has anti-inflammatory effects and also um, feed negative feedback on the apostat in the hypothalamus. So the butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid from the breakdown of the prebiotic foods, the butyrate then tells your brain to stop eating. So fiber and prebiotic fibers and resistant starch both soluble, insoluble fiber and resistant starch, both are, have a negative feedback loop to tell you to stop eating and, re, and reduce overeating, prevent your body from overeating. So you, you're sent, your brain senses those because even though the resistant starch doesn't come in as calories because 90% of them are lost, the fats pass through the digestive tract in the colon because they're formed in the distal part of the small intestines and proximal part, the beginning part of the large intestines. So 90% of the calories get lost, but the 10% get, gets absorbed as short chain fat has tremendous anti-diabetic effects, you know, um, anti-blood beneficial, anti-cancer and anti-blood pressure effects and effects on reducing your appetite. So I'm saying something unique here, I think, and that is that if you're looking to lose weight or reverse diabetes or just live longer or just have more muscle develop growth, that actually having a variety of foods in the meal, when you actually keeps you not hungry for many hours, it suppresses the appetite, it gives you better protein um, amino acid composition for muscle growth as an athlete. And at the ends of life and in the elderly, we have decreased protein bioavailability and maybe in the toddlers too, they need more protein and athletes need more protein. But the diversity of those foods gives you a better protein complement and gives you and sustains your, your um, slows absorption and sustains digestion. So you don't get hungry between meals. You are better satisfied. So a little bit of bean and a little bit of mushroom and a little bit of green and a little bit of grain, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of nutter seed, just a little bit of a few different foods at the meal. And all of a sudden, whoa, you got like, well, I, I could eat less calories and be satisfied for long periods of time and still get great muscle growth. 
So you can keep your body lean and muscular and be satisfied with the right amount of calories and variety of these types of food aids in that. Yes, fabulous, thank you. Um, what about fermented foods? Which ones help, which ones don't? Do you think that there's benefit there? I think there's benefits of fermented foods for people who do not follow a healthy diet. It improves the quality of the microbiome for people who don't eat enough beneficial fibers and prebiotics. I don't think I have to eat fermented foods or because my diet is otherwise has so much, it's so full of prebiotics and probiotics and, and, and postbiotics. Because um, we're eating the rainbow of all these healthy foods and you don't need the extra, you don't have to supply the good bacteria. They're in the gut, they're living there. We have a thickened biofilm. It's like the person, it's, it's like the person on the paleo diet, let's say, where they say they follow their blood sugars, you know, or they're reading their blood sugars all the time. They say, I can't eat oatmeal or, or, or mango because my blood sugars get too high. Well, because they don't have the thickened biofilm to slow the absorption and they're eating saturated fat, which distorts insulin receptors. So their insulin receptors don't work well. And the microbiome is unfavorable with gram negatives and, you know, and, and leaking. So they get a spike in response to oatmeal or mango. It's just, so they could be benefit from taking prebiotics. I mean, take, taking, um, um, fermented foods, you know, to build back the microbiome. But then when you're, when you're eating a healthy diet and you've got a really healthy bacteria buildup, you're eating a lot of all these foods we're talking about, and you've got a thickened microbiome, and you've got a good bacteria, then the additional probiotics probably become unnecessary at that point. Interesting. Do you think that uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, uh, other plant-based yogurts are uh, detrimental for some people or do you think that no. they're just unnecessary i mean i know there's a lot of salt in some of those but yeah just the salt yeah. content they're not detrimental there and if you enjoy them have them but obviously we can make our own like sauerkrauts or yogurt we can do it without the salt mm -hmm. you know and um and still make things and flavor things with vinegar yeah. things you know so yeah got it thank you um let's talk a little bit about what foods are harmful to the gut as well as immune health um, tell us about some of the most problematic ones and how how they're doing damage. Well, the most problematic ones are heated oils and fried foods and heated oils are probably a primary cause of inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. So when people get it, so you, you get um, rancidity of the oil, but the oil particularly is toxic to the bowel wall from a lots of different reasons. The other food that people eat so much of besides heated oils, and don't forget, a nutritarian diet, what I call a nutritarian diet, which we're obviously on the same page, whatever anybody else calls it. It's the idea that we're not getting our fats predominantly from oils and animal fats. We're getting our fats predominantly from natural whole plants like nuts, seeds, and avocados. And it has a different biological effect. One soothes the gut, heals the gut, and the other damages the gut wall, you know, but, and also not just the gut, the rest of the body. But in any case, um, the other food besides oils are white flour which is which is a sugar equivalent. So honey, maple syrup, and white flour and sugar are all the same thing. Even sucralose damages the gut, by the way. Even some of these, even some of these um, what are they called? Non-caloric sweeteners still yeah. can damage the gut wall. But um, but we know that um, these foods can fuel the proliferation of unhealthy bacteria and yeast. And also obviously, you know, on animal products, animal protein. Can feed can over, can cause the overgrowth of bacteria that produce toxic compounds like TMAO, like trimethylamine oxide, which is an endothelial toxin and actually promotes cancer and aging. So we, it's that you know they always say that um, like the meat and ice cream diet, you know, meats and sweets has the most affected related to pancreatic cancer and bowel disease. But they do, but Americans do so many things wrong simultaneously. They hardly do anything right. They only eat two percent of calories from vegetables, so it's it's really the fact that we have a, a a sickly population is to be expected, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you coined the acronym G bombs: greens, mm -hmm. beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, which is widely used. It's a fabulous guide for thinking about the major categories um, that we need to have in abundance in our diets. Two of those letters are, of course, onions and mushrooms, which we touched on earlier, which tend to be in the white and brown zone. Can you tell us about each of those in a little more depth 
um, what it is that you love about onions and mushrooms and their effect on the human body. And also seeds are brown too, right? Like flax sure, seeds. Sure, seeds fair and enough. Yeah. Sesame absolutely. seeds, and, you know, the hemp, they're all white and brown too. Yeah. Well, These let's are cover all three old. then. Yeah. <laughs> Those three white brownish foods are have incredible anti-cancer effects. And that's why in longevity promoting effect, that's why they're in the G bombs acronym. Because when I'm writing the book, Super Immunity, I'm pulling, you know, I, I review maybe 20,000, 30,000 articles. When I put 2,000 references in a book, I probably had to get, you know, pick the best 2,000 out of 10,000. I spent years pull, going over research. And what I'm saying is that there's an unbelievable amount of research on these foods, showing dramatic protection. Each food individually, just looking at onions alone, not people who are eating all these foods at the same time, just people eating onions and what onions do to a diet. You know, and, and, there's a, and some studies show between a 55 and 88% reduction of cancers of various types and people are eating a quarter cup of onions a day or more. And that's just the, the onion family. And of course we have shallots and scallions and garlic and red onion is all in that family. And I like to eat a variety of even, even a variety of onions. I want to put, and I grow scallions and I want to use different types, you know, use um, even different types of onions and garlic and shallots and scallion in the diet. And I think scallion is a superfood too. But in any case, um, and then you have mushrooms, which are, this, which are a wonderful, powerful anti-cancer food. So we're saying these foods have powerful anti-cancer effects. And there's lots of studies documenting their, their effects on the anti-cancer benefits. For example, um, studies on women who are eating a small amount of mushrooms showing a dramatic reduction, like a 64% reduction of breast cancer when followed over the decades of people eating mushrooms regularly. And, and then you have studies of like the of people who have cancer and then following the people who have cancer eating seeds or mushrooms or onions showing, wow, if you give this to people with cancer, their chance of having cancer death or reoccurrence of the cancer goes down by like 50 to 70%. One study with on lignans, and lignans are found in all on, on plant foods, but particularly high in seeds like flax seeds and chia seeds. Like one teaspoon of flax seeds, just a teaspoon has seven milligrams of lignin, that's huge. Because in this study that I'm referring to, just a third of a milligram of lignin reduced the risk of breast cancer recurrence and breast cancer death by about 70%. So when, when each of these foods has powerful effects and you put them together in a dietary portfolio that includes all these foods, then we see, wow, we are so, our body is so disease resistant, so cancer resistant, and even has the ability to take an early stage cancer and reverse it and get the person back healthy again. Because many people that are learning from you and me haven't been eating healthy their whole life. Yeah. They've maybe eaten unhealthily for half their life. And their question is, you know, am I, is my goose cooked? because I ate all these bad foods. And, the, and, and we're seeing the miraculous ability of the body to repair damage that could have occurred early in, in life, that the accumulation of methylation defects, broken cross links, absorption of toxic compounds starts to be reduced and go in the other direction. And the body has the ability to repair the damage gradually when you start putting all these foods in, a, in, a, in this favorable dietary portfolio. So yeah, you were asking about you know, mushrooms and onions and mushrooms have a lot of beneficial factors. They're so rich in beta glucans. They're so rich in, we talked about ergothionine. Mm -hmm. They have antigen binding lectins, which really um, label, stick to the surfaces of cells that are abnormal. So the immune system could rec better recognize abnormal cells and remove, kill and remove them before they can become hurt you or develop a tumor. So mushrooms improve the rec recognition of the immune system. And mushrooms are the most powerful anti-angiogenic food. And you have like nutritional gurus and doctors telling people that the most powerful, you know, nutritional discovery is angiogenesis and anti-angiogenesis because that drives cancer and that drives protection of the body. And mm -hmm. when we're saying, no, well, there's a lot of things that make a diet good, but one thing is, is anti-angiogenesis, not the whole thing, but, it, but it's still an important thing. And mushrooms are the most powerful anti-angiogenic. So angiogenesis means the growth of blood vessels and insulin, sugar, flour, and even animal protein can produce, the, can produce raise IGF-1, raise insulin, and raise angio, and is angiogenic promoting, which allows tumors to replicate, allows fat cells mm -hmm. to grow. But mushrooms, obviously, anti-angiogenic, 
don't allow, doesn't allow fat to get a blood supply, doesn't let fat grow on the body that easily, resists fat storage, accelerates fat loss. And by the way, mushrooms are about half protein. They're like the highest, they're super high in protein. And we're saying these diversity of proteins from these plants make you, you know, give you build muscle and bone, muscle and bone from eating meat. No, you build muscle and bone, long standing, healthy muscle and bone with great strength and resilience from eating a variety of these plants. At this, like with the mushrooms, with the greens, with the grains, with the nuts and seeds, with the beans, all in the same meal in a small amount, gives you incredible ability to, re, to build muscle and bone mass. And the mushrooms, of course, say, no way, Jose, I'm not going to let cancer cells replicate because they don't let cancer cells get a new blood supply because they need blood and they need nourishment. They got to have blood vessels grow into the cells for them to replicate. But mushrooms prevent that. And they, you know, they say they must be bilingual because they say, no way, Jose, you can't get those blood vessels grow. <laughs> Um, we got a couple comments I want to jump into uh, from our audience. Sharon said, it's always such a pleasure to hear Dr. Furman share his vast wealth of knowledge and so glad he does so through Food Revolution Network. Thank you, Dr. Furman. Thank you. Um, we heard from Karen who asked, how do you know if your gut is so healthy that you don't need to eat fermented foods? Mm. I guess you would know if you're eating a healthy diet, if you know how healthy your diet is. You know, it's funny because people are so interested in knowing their cholesterol and going, you know, and following the numbers. And I'm less interested in that. Yeah. In following the numbers because the people, because doctors like to follow numbers because it's something they can give a drug to control and go up and down. And I'm saying it's much more important to look at the, your diet and to look at your body weight and to look at your, because it's an, this is an art. It's a science, but it's an art. The art is we become the scientist slash artist of our own bodies. Mm -hmm. And we know the, uh, the right foods to eat for us. And we know the amount of foods to eat for us because you got to regulate the amount of food you eat to make sure you're at your perfect weight, right? So you're regulating. And if you're not at your perfect weight, you need to regulate something or change what you're eating or change the balance of what you're eating or change. So we have to become this artist scientist to become the best version of ourselves, the healthiest yeah. version of ourselves. And people know when they've, and they always say, how do I know if I'm not going to have a heart attack? Well, if you have a normal blood pressure without medication and you have a normal cholesterol without medication and you have a normal exercise tolerance and your normal body weight and you're eating a healthy diet and you have, you know, then you're protected. In other words, you, what are your lifestyle habits that show your, and if your lifestyle habits translate into, to be into good health, do you feel well and are you physically fit and are you not overweight and are you eating the right foods? And then, you, you know, so you should, you should be able to, to judge that without expensive or invasive or medical tests or medical visit or doctor um, interventions. You know you're eating healthy, you feel great, and you're slim and muscular, and you're fit, and you can be physically active, and you have your full mental faculties, and so earn good, you earn good health. Yeah. I remember I asked Dr. Joel Kahn at one point, um, what's the number one test you would use if you were trying to gauge someone's heart disease risk? And he said, what are you eating? <laughs> he said, I, I care more about that than any single blood metric you can measure. Wow, at the end of that's, the day, that's, that's more so indicative of of longevity and perfect outcome. answer. And I and I don't agree, you know, for, so it's great for me to agree with to find to have agree with him on that because that's exactly a great answer. That's a great answer. Um, Andre asked, "Mushrooms better raw or cooked?" They're better cooked. Yeah, they're more absorbable. The nutrients become absorbed better, and you don't. And the and also the white button mushroom which is also related to the cremini and the portobello mushroom, have a mild, mild toxin called a garotene, which blows off with cooking. So the other mushrooms, so it's probably better you eat most of those raw, most of those cooked anyway, to, to lower your garotene exposure. But you do get better absorption and you get utilization. So you, you, um, it's better to eat most of your mushrooms cooked. Got it. Thank you. Joel, it's been wonderful having this time with you. Again, thank you so much. Any closing words before we wrap our time with you today? Well, just it's exciting for me to see um, people, you and others reaching out and affecting so many thousands of people and encouraging them to take such better care of their health. And I'm proud of every person that's part of this and working to better their health because, the, you know, we form an army that betters the world and betters and, and it makes you it gets you more gives you more creative goodwill for other people. So you got to start with your own self first and then you can reach out and help others. And you'll become a shining example of good health to be able to accomplish more to help others. And so I'm proud of every one of you. That's so beautiful. And I've just been reflecting on that, that when we feel good, we're more likely to do good. 
We're yes. more likely to make good choices. We're more likely to impact others in good ways. And our feeling good is also contagious and inspires others to want to be more like us. So there are these positive feedback loops that get set in motion that help us build momentum towards not just healthier lives, but more fulfilling, satisfying, and contributory lives. And Julie, you're such a shiny example exactly. of that. Thank you so Thank much you. for being with us and for your leadership and wisdom and brilliance. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. And we thank you again. Have a beautiful day. Take care. Bye, everybody. And everybody else, we're going to keep right on rolling here. Um, we want to talk a little bit more about how you make this happen in your life. We've been hearing a lot about how white and brown plant-based foods can help regulate gut health and build healthy immune function and help to fight cancer and help us feel better. But it's not always easy to incorporate these foods into our diets. Some people don't like beans or cauliflower or even mushrooms. In fact, some folks really don't like mushrooms. So what to do? Well, that means it's time for me to turn the mic over to Nicole and Rosie and Will, starting with Nicole. Thanks, Ocean. What a great interview with Dr. Herman. He's just brilliant and always an inspiration. Um, okay, so the great news is that they, we have a lot of variety. We've got so many foods from which to choose in the white and brown category, including whole grains. And just within that category, we have a lot of foods to choose. We talked about oats during this conversation and um, we've got farro, we've got a, such a variety of whole grains, buckwheat, lots of them, quinoa, we've got legumes, so lentils and a variety of types of beans and the allium group, with do, which Dr. Furman is a huge fan of, like onions and shallots, they are all helpful for a healthy gut. So you've got lots of foods from which to choose in this category. And then we, um, these foods are also high in uh, one of the types of fiber, insoluble fiber, as well as the other types. So a lot of these foods have both types of fiber, insoluble and soluble. Some of them also have the fermentable type of fiber. And these foods, the um, tan and white and brown group, whole grains, legumes and alliums, mushrooms, they have variety a, a variety of, of types of fiber. So the insoluble helps to move um, our food through and adds bulk to the stool, prevents constipation, soluble fiber. Um, one of the types of soluble fiber can be fermentable, which helps to foster a healthy gut. And the brown and white foods also contain what we talked about also in the conversation or what you talked about, Ocean, in the conversation with Dr. Furman, um, resistant starch, which acts like a prebiotic helping to feed healthy bacteria in our gut and um, helping those healthy bacteria flourish, supporting a diverse gut microbiome. How about you, Will? Do you have anything to add? Oh, definitely. Thanks, Nicole. And, and uh, I echo what you said about the interview with Ocean and Dr. Furman, always uh, inspired. And wow, I just, I mean, I feel like I learned a ton from that interview. What a, what a, a really important uh, mind in this movement. So again, a, a thank you to Dr. Furman. So yes, Nicole, these brown and white foods are um, also really beneficial as they are low in fat and absent of cholesterol, which can help reduce the risk of digestive disorders and maintain uh, optimal gut function. Uh, whole grains and legumes are a source of B vitamins, which play a vital role in gut health and the proper functioning of the digestive system. These foods are often a good source of other vitamins and minerals too, such as zinc, selenium, vitamin E, a really important antioxidant vitamin, which are, are all known to help maintain a healthy immune response. Uh, these foods also promote stable blood sugar levels and prevent spikes that can disrupt gut health. As Dr. Furman mentioned, uh, specifically with mushrooms too, great source of protein. So th those proteins, uh, and also obviously in, in our whole grains and legumes, um, also kind of help to stabilize uh, blood sugar levels and prevent those spikes. So can't say uh, too much about uh, uh, the good stuff about brown and white foods. They're just truly incredible foods to include in our diets. Uh, Rosie, speaking of diets and including these foods in our, in our routines, uh, is it time to get into our recipes? It sure is. Thanks, Will. So today for Brown and White Day, we have two recipes, our easier and our advanced. And our easier recipe is a really vibrant, simple four ingredient lemony mushrooms. And our advanced is the mushroom lentil trees or taco bowl. Nicole, would you like to share a little bit about how they can make either of these recipes? 
Absolutely. Thanks, Rosie. So the simple four ingredient lemony mushrooms, um, as you, as the name implies, that is very, it's very simple. Um, but it actually, I think demonstrates the, um, the potency of a simple recipe and hitting all of the taste buds, like all of those elements, the sweet, the, the uh, umami flavor from the mushrooms, you have some of that brightness from the lemon juice and maybe a little bit of bitter and sour in there. And then just like a little touch of salt brings it all together as well as the shallots. Um, you get some pungency. So you get lots of flavor bursts from just these simple ingredients. So that's our easy recipe for the day. And then the um, our advanced recipe for the day, the advanced portion, um, I think if you can think about it as what you can prepare ahead. So um, it's a the mushroom, as Rosie mentioned, the mushroom lentil trezo taco bowl. Um, it looks like a long recipe. However, there are lots of spices in there and um, some that are in the brown category, um, tons of antioxidants, phytonutrients in these spices. So, and they obviously add a ton of, also a ton of flavor. So I encourage you to use any spices that you're able to tolerate in there to create that chorizo flavor experience. Um, and then you've got several of the brown foods. So we've got, and the brown and white foods, so you've got uh, brown rice, you've got mushrooms and you have um, well, brown or grain lentils. So you might be getting a grain in there, which is totally fine. Um, so the trick here with uh, the, the advanced portion is preparing ahead. So the lentils and the brown rice, you can prepare ahead of time. Once they're prepared ahead of time, um, this meal comes together in minutes. The mushroom chorizo is really, um, and mushroom lentil chorizo comes together and uh, very quickly on the stovetop. So I would suggest having those lentils on hand, pre-cooked, ready to go, having the rice pre-cooked. And then the five minute cheesy sauce um, takes five minutes to create. That's another one that you can prepare ahead of time. So you can keep all of these ingredients that you can prepare ahead of time, the lentils, the rice and cheesy sauce in the refrigerator for several days before you re you're ready to assemble this dish. Um, but knowing y'all and what you, you've, you probably already have these ready to go. <laughs> you probably did it yesterday um, because you're all are on top of it. But I just wanted to let you know like why we decided to label this one in advance. So there's some prep ahead instructions there. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Rosie. Thanks, Nicole. I myself am very excited to try the simple lemony mushrooms. Everyone has been raving about them who have already tried it. So now I need to get in the kitchen and make my own bowl. And speaking of everyone raving and using the comment section, it's been so much fun getting to read all of your experiences and seeing all of your posts throughout the challenge. Our forum thread has never been so colorful. So definitely keep posting, keep engaging, keep supporting one another because we see that quite a bit too. Um, and just a reminder that when you are posting, two photos get you two entries into the prize drawing and a narrative only post about your recipe creation gets you one. So keep on posting, you guys. You guys are doing great. All righty, back to you, Ocean. Well, thank you so much, Will and Nicole and, and Rosie. Um, and I'm just loving the celebration of the deliciousness and the abundance of healthy food in this world. You know, there are literally thousands of delicious, amazing foods that can be combined in all kinds of creative ways that can help our bodies to thrive, that can light up our taste buds. And uh, it's just such a delight to learn and grow together, isn't it? Um, and so I just wanna thank everybody so much, reading through the comments, seeing the pictures, hearing the descriptions, and knowing that there's lots of people who aren't posting but are also participating, I just want to thank every single one of you for being a part of this movement of health and vitality. And again, if you ever feel alone, if you ever feel lost, if you ever feel isolated, please know you're not. There are so many of us who are joining in this celebration and creation process and changing the way we eat and changing the way the world eats together one step of, at a time. Um, and thanks for joining us in this brown and white day as we celebrate a special part of the culinary rainbow. Um, and um, I also want to say for those of you who um, are part of Whole Life Club, you know how special it is. For those of you who are not yet, if you feel like you may want this kind of support long term, if you want more recipes, more kitchen demos, more connection, more community, more space to ask questions, more place to engage, and a steady wind at your back to keep getting re-inspired, not just for six days, but for your whole life. 
whole life club may just be for you. And I want to make sure everybody knows that the doors are open for just a couple more days to join in whole life club for this season and be a part of this cohort and get in for a special price and an opportunity to join in with that two week trial for just a dollar. So please check that out. If that's something you're thinking about, you've just got a couple more days to make up your mind as part of the Eat the Rainbow Challenge, you can get in. Normally it's not so easy to join Whole Life Club, but this is a moment when you can. Now, I wanna jump into a couple of the comments that we've been receiving. Um, Let's see, uh, we heard from Matilda who asked, how long for an unhealthy person to have a healthy gut after starting plant-based? Well, Matilda, of course it depends. The, the good news is that it's never too late to start making changes and reaping benefits and that every step you take matters. And literally some things can change very quickly. Like literally as you're eating healthy foods, the good guys are proliferating and propagating and evolving and the diversity of good bacteria in your microbiome will expand dramatically and rapidly. Um, that said, it some changes take longer and it partly depends where you're starting from and how abundantly you're leaning into healthy food and whether you're still eating things like sugars and white flowers and toxic oils and animal products and that could be dragging you backwards. So lots and lots of factors at play. There's no one simple thing. We see people that are continuing to reap benefits and get better years and years and years downstream. And then you optimize and you diversify. A lot of people go plant-based, but they have just a few things. So part of what we're trying to help you do is really enjoy the rainbow. And that can help you really get the benefits the most abundantly and rapidly. People say eat a varied and balanced diet. Well, obviously, when we say varied and balanced, we mean varied and balanced amongst the healthy foods, right? Uh, moderation is often touted as a virtue, but at FRN, I don't think we see moderation as a virtue if you're eating moderate amounts of foods that are making you sick, right? I don't consume a moderate amount of heroin. I don't consume any heroin, right? Like, it's not what's not good for us, we don't want to do, right? So I apply the same kind of principle to some of the really unhealthy foods. Um, but at the same time, you're in your own journey. So I think that you may find uh, that within a matter of days, if not weeks, you are feeling the benefits. And then hopefully that will continue to lift up. We literally see that people, their blood cholesterol levels can change within a day of changing their diet or two or three. And within a month, sometimes dramatically so, LDL cholesterol levels come down. You know, we see people's uh, my biomarkers for diabetes shift sometimes very rapidly. So powerful changes, food really can be medicine. Um, and as far as there's no one like um, destination spot where it's like, okay, I've got a healthy gut now, I'm all good. It's a journey, it's an evolution, and hopefully one that keeps making you healthier and happier and more fulfilled as the years go by. De Niro said, love the questions you asked Dr. Furman, especially the one about fermented foods, as this is something I was curious about myself. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Danara, actually, I guess it was. Um, thank you so much, Danara. And um, yeah, I was actually, I hadn't, to be honest with you, I hadn't heard about that before, the notion that, that fermented foods are not um, necessary uh, if you're eating lots of prebiotics and a fundamentally healthy diet. Um, I think that so many people are eating a not healthy diet that we have a lot of studies showing health benefits from fer fermented foods, but we don't have a lot of studies on people who are already eating a fabulous diet looking at how to make it even more fabulous. And so we are kind of pioneers, if you will, we're innovators in that field as we move in this direction together. Hopefully those studies will be coming out soon enough as we have more and more people that are stepping into healthy food choices and then we can look at how to optimize from there. Andrea said, thank you, I appreciate your help. Um, lots of other great questions. Thank you all so much for asking them and for posting. And as we move towards the end of today, I just want to say again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us in this journey. It is just thrilling. And I want to encourage you to not just post, which we definitely want to encourage you to do so you can be eligible for prizes and so you can share in the fun, but also to read other people's posts, look at other people's pictures and leave some hearts, leave some likes, leave some responses so we can keep building the sense of community. Scroll on through those comments, see what folks are saying, and let's build the feeling of connectivity together. Tomorrow, our focus is going to be on the whole rainbow. 
It's called Make the Rainbow Day, and we're going to have more space for questions and answers. So if you've got questions about nutrition, about food, about food preparation, about the rainbow, about anything we've talked about this week, tomorrow's going to be a chance to go deeper into that. So you can go ahead and start posting your questions now or save them for tomorrow, and we'll get to as many as we can tomorrow as a part of our day together. And remember, the challenge team is spending time in the forum, so questions can also be answered in there. And please keep posting your recipes and sharing and engaging. It is so fun to see how we're building community and connection around healthy food together. Um, and one more time, I just want to say again, if you haven't yet joined Whole Life Club, make sure you don't miss out on this incredible opportunity. This is where we see the greatest, deepest, most profound changes happen in Food Revolution Network's work. So now it's almost time to wrap up for today. And I just want to ask Will, Nicole, and Rosie to share any more words of enthusiasm about brown and white foods and anything else they wanted to say as we complete our time. Let's start with you, Will. Sure thing. Thank you, Ocean. Sorry for that delay. Always got to find that unmute button. And <laughs> <sometimes> We've <laughs> all learned a lot about that the last few years. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, oh, yes. Wow. Day five. It just went so quickly as it always does. I feel like same thing with the summit, right? It just flies by. Um, yes, please keep engaging in the forum. I actually have a comment here that I want to read because I think it's actually really, um, I think it could be really helpful for people to hear this. So I'm going to start there and then see if I have any last thoughts uh, afterwards. But Linda just wrote just a few minutes ago, Luna said, oh, since we've been doing this challenge, my gut is so reacting. All the fiber is moving in and the flour, sugar, and meat is freaking out. I will say, I don't feel like I have to eat all day. I am satiated. Mm. I think that's such an important thing that Linda brought up. Um, everyone is coming into this challenge and to this journey and eating whole food plant-based at a different point. Everyone's system is a little bit different. But one thing that I do often see um, say across the board entirely, but it's quite common, is that when people start to increase fiber, fiber-rich foods in their diet, sometimes their system can, can kind of change a little bit and, and they can feel it, like Linda's expressing here, whatever those symptoms may be, you kind of know what I'm talking about. But I think that's actually, um, it's quite common, it's quite normal for there to be some of that, um, uh, maybe a little bit of distress as your system's kind of better uh, adapting and tolerating these nourishing fiber rich foods. So if that's happening to you, I want to say that, uh, it, like I said, it's quite normal. Of course, if it's happening super intensely, that might be a different situation. You may need to slow down a little bit, reduce those portions, maybe give yourself a little bit of break with those fiber rich foods, but you're going to build up to it. You're going to build up to better uh, being able to tolerate those foods. So again, quite normal. I don't want anyone to feel that way, feel like they're doing something wrong and then stop eating these foods or say this is not for them. Like I said, it, it is quite normal for the system to need to kind of go through the, the emotions of, of adapting to these foods. And sometimes there is a little bit of distress with that, um, but uh, you know, nothing that time probably can't help you with. And then also water. It's really, really important as we're increasing these fiber rich foods to increase our water intake as well. Water really, really helps to make sure that those symptoms aren't felt for as long or as intensely. The hydration is just a really critical component when we're increasing our fiber rich foods. So thank you, Linda, for posting that because I don't think we've we've mentioned that uh, in, in the challenge thus far in day five, maybe more people are feeling that now. So uh, Linda, yeah. thank you. And, and really that's a testament to what this community is about. Ocean, you keep talking about Whole Life Club. These are the questions and conversations that happen in Whole Life Club, right? What, these very real, how do we make this practical for us? How do we get through this journey? How do we support each other through this journey? These conversations happen day in and day out. I'm so looking forward to tomorrow, uh, the Q&A, uh, Eat the Rainbow Day, because in addition to our cooking demos that we have uh, monthly with Nicole and Rosie and myself there in the background um, every every month in, in Whole Life Club, we also have our coaching and culinary Q&As. So tomorrow, for folks who aren't part of Whole Life Club yet, tomorrow is going to be a really, really fun sneak peek into what we offer on a monthly basis, which is a live Q&A event, just a, a conversation filled event answering uh, questions from the community. So super, super excited about tomorrow.
Will, thank you for that. And, you know, I will add that there is a certain portion of people who start eating a lot more fiber in their diet and can actually get gas and gastrointestinal distress and other challenges because their system is adjusting and sometimes rapidly. And so it's sometimes re recommended to ease into fiber increases. You know, I, although there's an optimal amount, some people say we should be getting, you know, 40 grams a day, maybe 50 grams a day even. But if you've been eating 15, you may need to go to 12, I mean, excuse me, to 20 for a bit and then to 25 and not just jump straight to 30 or 40. Uh, and that isn't to say that you can't make the jump, but if you find that you're getting distressed, you may need to back it off a little bit and then go slowly in again because your body's adjusting and all those bacteria are proliferating and it can be a little chaotic, big change. Sometimes big change just feels really good, but other times it can be a bumpy process. And so have patience with yourself, have compassion for yourself. If you have a little gas or you feel a lot more going on down there and there's more gurgling and more activity, just send some extra love. And I, I like to think that, that any body part that is experiencing sensation, like I wanna get curious. I wanna listen with loving care. Maybe put your hand on your tummy, spend some time just listening, feeling what's happening. Sometimes that love and that connection can turn discomfort or new sensation into something that actually feels alive and vital and growthful. Cause that's literally what's happening is that bacteria are proliferating and, and uh, reproducing in large quantities because they got food to eat maybe for the first time. And they're like, Yahoo, let's go. And then sometimes that gets a little nutsy in there. So just having some, some compassion, some curiosity and some love. And I think our tummies are uniquely susceptible to that. I remember the meditation teacher, Stephen Levine used to lead like, like week long retreats focused on a healthy, happy tummy. As a, as a sense of like having a soft belly. And I think that that softness is partly like calm and peace and care. And I think there's especially a powerful dynamism to a soft belly that is alive and vital. When you combine that, you've got the ingredients for a lot of joy and power in your life. So I think just bringing loving attention and witness and care and curiosity can help and noticing how your body responds to different foods. Just because we're saying something super healthy doesn't mean it's super healthy for you. Just because it's healthy in thousands of studies for a lot of people doesn't mean it's the right thing for everybody all the time. So listening to your own body, getting curious, being present, and also realizing something may not work right now. And then in a few weeks, it might, because your body's adapting and adjusting. So it's a journey, step by step towards getting healthier and more vital. And we're so glad to be on that journey with you. Okay, Nicole, any closing words you wanna to share today? Thanks, Ocean. Yeah, well, I love that you said, um, just to kind of like connect to your belly and be kind and conscious and listen, because I, just as you and Will are mentioning, I hear the same often that, you know, sometimes you, folks can experience gas and discomfort when inter introducing new foods. If you're not accustomed to eating much fiber throughout the day, you want to um, increase it slowly or add one or two new foods a week, you know, it just depends on each individual. So moving slowly as Ocean mentioned, but if you can be with that for a moment and just recognize that your body is adjusting and that you're literally, as Ocean mentioned, you're waking up that healthy bacteria in the gut. You're waking them up and they're excited and they're munching away on that fiber. And yes, there may some be, there may be some um, residual gas that happens. And for some that can dissipate in a couple of days. For others, it may take a few weeks. Be patient. Um, but I think what you mentioned, Ocean, that mindfulness and just kind of being gentle on yourself and recognizing that it, it's the healthy bacteria waking up alleviates the stress because if you become stressed do, because of that reaction that your body's having, it's a, it could be a positive reaction and, um, and you know what's happening, but that stress can feed into it more. So just being with it and being mindful of what it is, but as Ocean mentioned, also knowing yourself. So everybody is an individual, every single person, um, you know, there's some foods that may help you thrive. There are other foods that maybe aren't your favorite plant-based foods, or they just don't, you know, they, they don't feel good to you for whatever reason. Um, so just knowing your own body and recognizing what foods help you thrive, um, keeping a daily journal may help 
But again, just to reiterate what both Will and Ocean mentioned, move slow, drink plenty of water, slow in terms of either, either quantities or the variety of types of foods. If you are experiencing extra gas, it can be common. And um, and we're with you. And I just wanted to comment also just on the support and Whole Life Club. And here, um, it, it just all the support that we've had here in this challenge this week has been incredible. Y'all have been supporting each other and cheering each other on. And that's really exciting to see. And um if you want to continue that journey and that support and, and this whole cheerleading community, we definitely have that same thing in Whole Life Club. And I think that's one of the beauties and gifts about the, our community is that um, our live calls are really special because we get to connect, but also just like we're doing here on, the, on our challenge forum, it's just like that in Whole Life Club. And everyone's always cheering each other on. We're sharing experiences. Will and Rosie and Ocean and I are here to support you, but we learn equally as much from you and your own experience and what things you do with your recipes. So that's why we love hearing um, your modifications and substitutions and all. And you, you always give us ideas as well. So we appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. And uh, like Will, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you. Last words from Rosie. Thanks, Ocean. What else can I add? You guys have so much love and appreciation for brown and white foods. And I feel like they are a color that's often kind of put on the back burner. We don't think about them as often or uh, tend to appreciate what they can add. But what I'd like to say about the brown and white foods as you start to incorporate them more is sometimes they can be a little bit of a polarizing flavor, texture for many of us. Um, but what I've learned through my own experience exploration with brown and white foods is that as you adapt, like you mentioned before, Ocean, um, they start to take on this like really nice, robust, earthly, savory flavor, which often can be a great substitution for any meat products if many of you are still relying on animal protein in your diet. So definitely keep playing around with flavors and textures. Enjoy the benefits that Will, Ocean, and Nicole shared, as well as Dr. Furman. There's definitely a lot of um, room for creativity, exploration with brown and white foods. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. And just a quick word, because I don't think the words have been spoken today, but jicama and daikon radish. <laughs> Superstars too. All right, everybody. Thank you. It's been lots of fun. We'll see you tomorrow for Rainbow Day. Have a good one. We'll sign off now. Thank you. <laughs>